Today we'll be starting chapter two that deals with chemistry. Uh, the title of the chapter is uh, the Chemistry of Life. So our first lesson is going to be 2.1, The Nature of Matter. So I want to start out with thinking about what are we made of? So you know, buildings are made up of brick, steel, glass, wood, but living things are made from chemical compounds. So when you breathe, eat, drink, all of this stuff, uh, we carry out chemical reactions that ultimately help keep us alive. The first job of a biologist is to really understand the chemistry of life. So our first learning goal is to identify the three subatomic particles that make up atoms. So chemistry began a long, long time ago, over 2,500 years ago, with this Greek philosopher named Democritus. Now, he really got an idea of this, uh, this basic idea of the atom. So he really started asking himself, can you divide any substance, you know, this wood, steel, whatever the case is, without limit? Or does there come some point where you can't divide it anymore? Okay, so uh, it's just like factoring in math. Eventually, you get down to only prime numbers. So he thought there would be a limit. He called the smallest fragment the atom, which from the Greek word uh, atomus means unable to be cut. So atoms are really, really, really small. Guys, to give you an idea, 100 million atoms of carbon laid side by side would make a row only about one centimeter long. Okay, so it's really, really, really tiny. Despite their extremely small size, they actually contain subatomic particles that are even smaller than that. So the subatomic particles that make up atoms are protons, neutrons, and electrons. So let's talk about where exactly those are and what they are. So protons, they are positively charged. Okay, neutrons, they are neutrally charged. So both of these are found in the what's called the nucleus of the atom. We see it right here in this purple and uh a purplish blue and green right here in the nucleus of the atom. Our protons have our positive charge, neutrons, they have no charge at all. Now, electrons, the electrons are negatively charged, okay? They are found outside the nucleus. And when I say they are tiny, I mean they are tiny, tiny, tiny. They have 1 1840th the mass of a proton. So protons are even smaller than atoms, but electrons are tiny, tiny, tiny. In fact, they are so small that we don't even count their mass when measuring the mass of atoms. Okay, so because atoms have equal numbers of electrons and protons, typically they are going to be neutral. So carbon, for example, is shown here with one, two, three, four, five, six protons and one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. So a positive six and a negative six, think of it just like math, gives you zero. So six minus zero would be zero. So that's not always the case. So sometimes we have what are called isotopes. So our next learning goal, how are all the isotopes of an element similar? Well, a chemical element is going to be a pure substance. So what we see right here in this picture is mercury, sometimes called quicksilver. Okay, So there are more than 100 elements that are known, but only about two dozen are commonly found in living organisms. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, all of these that we'll talk about in this course. So the number of protons in the nucleus of an element is called its atomic number. Make sure you highlight that. That's going to be really important to note. Now, carbon's atomic number is six. And what that means is that each atom of carbon has six protons, and because it's neutral, has six electrons as well. Now, isotopes, though, sometimes we have a different number of what are called the neutrons that we talked about. Okay, so atoms of the same element that differ in the number of neutrons they contain are known as isotopes. Okay, so carbon-12, our, our regular carbon we see all the time. Six protons, six electrons, six neutrons. Okay, so six and six, giving us our atomic number. But carbon-14, that's one that I really want to talk about. We see six protons and eight neutrons, okay, giving it, you know, two more than carbon-12. Okay, so the total number of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of an atom is called its atomic mass number. So isotopes are identified by their mass numbers, so carbon-12, 13, and 14. So the weighted average of the masses of an element's isotopes uh, give it the atomic mass. So because the same number of electrons, uh, all isotopes of an element have the same chemical properties. We'll talk about why that is later in this chapter. So radioactive isotopes. Now, radioactive isotopes, uh, radioactive means that the nuclei are unstable. They break down at a constant rate over time. So we can use this radioactive carbon that we see right here, carbon-14, to tell how old something is. Okay, So we use this in what's called carbon dating. So the fossils that you find, you know, if you go on an exploration and you discover you know, a Tyrannosaurus rex 
bone, you can determine how old it is by carbon dating it. So uh, radiation from certain isotopes can be used to detect and treat cancer, even kill bacteria that cause food to spoil. Okay, they can be used as labels or tracers to follow the movements of substances within organisms. So if you go and, uh, you know, if any of your family members have ever had cancer, um, you know, it's uh, chemotherapy when you have that radiation treatment. Okay, oftentimes they use radioactive isotopes as a form of treatment for cancer. All right, so let's talk about chemical compounds now. So we've talked about atoms, we've talked about elements, but what it, you know, what is an actual compound? So how do compounds differ from their component elements? So a chemical compound, see the vocabulary word here, make sure you highlight it in your notes, is a substance formed by the chemical combination of two or more elements in definite proportions. That's really, really, really important. So uh, in the next paragraph, we see here that water, for example, contains two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, okay? So its chemical formula is H2O. Every water molecule will have two hydrogens, one oxygen. Table salt is sodium chloride, meaning that every table salt compound has one sodium and one chlorine. That's it, okay? We can't have two chlorines. We can't have four sodiums and one chlorine that wouldn't be table salt, that wouldn't be sodium chloride. So the physical and chemical properties are usually very different from those from the elements in which it's formed. Now, chlorine gas, for example, is very, very, very reactive. It's poisonous, it will kill you if you take a deep breath of it. Sodium is actually a highly explosive metal. It's not poisonous, okay, but um, if you expose pure sodium to water, it will actually explode. And I'm actually going to show a uh, video of that when you guys come to class, okay? Now, chemical bonds. So how is it we even hold all of this together? We've talked about our atoms all the way down at the protons, neutrons, and electrons. But once we make them into atoms and elements and compounds and molecules, how do we hold them together? Well, the atoms and compounds are held together by various types of what are called chemical bonds, okay? So bond formation involves the electrons that surround each atomic nucleus. So the main types are ionic and covalent. And we're talking about a special one called hydrogen bond, sometimes called van der Waals forces. So an ionic bond is formed when one or more electrons is transferred, underline it, circle it, put a box around it, exclamation marks, put stars around it, transferred from one atom to another. Now, an atom that loses electrons becomes positively charged. Why is that? Because remember, electrons have a negative charge. If you give one away, you haven't lost a proton, so we become positive. So the positive, the atom that gains the electrons now becomes negative. So let's look at some simple math down here. Sodium, 11 protons, 11 electrons. Positive 11 minus 11 is zero. Positive 17 minus 17 is zero. So that's for chlorine. But when we give this away, give away this electron, positive 11 minus 10 is plus one. And we see that over here, this chloride ion, okay, this Cl minus, we have 17 protons crammed together in this nucleus. And then if we were to count them all up, one, two, three, four, five, and we skip to 18, we have 18 electrons. So 17 minus 18 is a negative one. So I'm sure you've heard the phrase opposites attract before. Okay, so we see right here a positive charge, a negative charge. They actually are attracted to each other. Okay, so this sodium and chloride, uh, chlorine atoms, when they are ions, it's a sodium ion, a chloride ion, they are actually attracted together and they form sodium chloride. So the ionic bond forms between them to form table salt. So uh, we see the sodium atom easily loses its one valence electron and becomes a sodium ion. Now that's because, I mean, practically speaking, it's a lot easier to give one thing away than to try and take seven from it. Okay, so the chlorine atom, it's easier for it to try and take one than give away seven. Okay, so the oppositely charged ions have the strong attraction for each other. Once they do, they form this ionic bond. Now, covalent bond, sometimes electrons are shared. So the moving electrons travel about the nuclei of both atoms, forming a covalent bond. Vocabulary word, highlight it, definitely important. Now, I want everyone to pay attention here very carefully. When atoms share two electrons, the bond is called a single covalent bond. So single covalent bond, two shared electrons. 
Sometimes we share four electrons forming a double bond and six electrons forming a triple bond. Now, these triple bonds, they are not very common at all. They're only found in a few substances, so we're not going to focus on those as much. We're going to focus more on the single and the double bonds. So the structure of water, for example, is held together with a uh, single with a, a single covalent bond. So we share this hydrogen, this oxygen together to form this water molecule, and uh, we always share this pair of electrons. So when the atoms of the same element join together, they also form a molecule. So remember, every molecule of water contains one oxygen and two hydrogens. Oxygen molecules in the air you breathe consist of two atoms of oxygen that are covalently bonded together. Now, if you have that individual oxygen, it's not very stable. It always wants to be bound to another oxygen. So lastly, van der Waals forces. It sounds really, really fancy. It's kind of confusing, but hopefully we can clarify it. So sometimes covalently bonded molecules, they aren't shared equally, meaning their charges aren't. We don't share those electrons, you know, fairly all the way around. Uh, even when sharing is equal, the rapid movements can sometimes create readings on one molecule that might be slightly positive, another part being slightly negative, but they really just kind of stay the same. So these intermolecular forces of attraction are called van der Waals forces. And that's because, you know, the dude that discovered him, his last name was van der Waals. You know, like I said, that's kind of how we do in science. You discover something, it becomes really important. You get to name it after yourself. So they are not very, very strong, but when they are put together, when you take billions of them, put them together, they do become very, very, very strong. So we find van der Waals forces in water. So they form these surface tension in water. So that's why when, you know, you were trying to show off on the diving board when you were, you know, 11 or 12 years old, you're trying to do that somersault, you come down and you do the belly flop. The reason that it hurts so much is you have to break billions and billions and billions of van der Waals forces between different water molecules. We'll talk about that in uh, the lesson that we have in this chapter dealing just with water. So if you have any questions, you can email me at mr.tucker.schs at gmail.com or you can post it in the comments below.